Okay. Here we go. Happy Friday. Hello, friends. Friends. Hello. Um. T. Earl Grey. Make it so. Ooh, that's hot. So today I um I saw this video on YouTube and I have to react to it because it's combining two totally different topics that most people know nothing about and I know essentially like a hefty chunk about. So I saw this video on YouTube, uh, Nassim Taleb, and this, so I follow his channel and he is reacting to Bill Gates. He, the title of this video is, The Gates Foundation is Repeating the Errors of Mao. And he's talking about the Gates Foundation's support of what he's saying is genetically modified insects, um, which I know a lot about because I, I literally like study all this stuff. That's literally like what I work on is directly essentially like applied to this. This is literally like my field of expertise. Um, and funny enough, I have read every single one of Nassim Taleb's books. I love Nassim Taleb. I love Nassim Taleb. Um, everybody, everybody thinks he's a huge asshole, which is one reason why I love him. Uh, and he also loves Nietzsche. So uh, I love assholes who love Nietzsche. Um, and I love Nassim Taleb, read all of his books. I, I first heard about Nassim Taleb from, funny enough, Newt Gingrich. Newt Gingrich Nassim Taleb had read it, written an essay, Intellectual Yet Idiot. I think it was a short essay. I read his essay and Newt Gingrich had written a commentary on it. Okay. And I read essentially just this essay. This was my first exposure to Nassim Taleb. He's making fun of a bunch of intellectuals in this essay and talking about essentially why like intellectuals and professors are stupid. Uh, and Newt Gingrich thought it was good. So Newt Gingrich wrote an essay about Nassim Taleb's essay. And that's how I got exposed to it. So uh, I actually emailed Nassim Taleb after I had read that because um, I, I thought like I, this was the dumbest thing you could possibly do. Like email somebody not having read them, not having like knowing their contents. Like I literally had just read this essay. And I emailed Nassim Taleb. I found his academic email because he's a professor at some college in New York. Um, I found his email. And this is when I was at Yale. And I sent him an email. I was like, hey, I, I blah, 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 blah. I'm working at Yale. I'm working on genetic modification of mosquitoes is what I said. Uh, and then only later did I learn that Nassim just, Nassim just completely hates the genetic modification um, of organisms and of, of insects. But anyway, I, I emailed him um, and I was essentially like, the, the, again, the dumbest thing you could, the, I'm so stupid. The dumbest thing you could possibly say to an author, a famous author, I said something like, hey, I read this essay. I like this essay. Do you have any books you would recommend for me to read further? Which is again, like probably like the dumbest thing you could say to an author because it's like, well, yeah, duh, read my fucking books, you dumb idiot. <laughs> which was probably, which is probably what he thought. Um, but I was just kind of like looking to start a conversation. He never emailed me back. So he probably didn't even see it. Maybe he did see it, but he thought, just thought I was so stupid he didn't respond. Uh, or maybe he didn't even see it. But essentially after that, like that essay got me really interested in Nassim Taleb. And I read all of his books uh, and, and a lot of his thoughts actually changed my mind, like, um, about a lot of stuff. I, I was really gung ho about ecological engineering and genetic modification and reading his books actually sort of like did change my mind a little bit about that. He makes compelling arguments about essentially moving slowly. So, okay. Anyway, I've read all his books, so I know who he is, um, and he's also he's also very influenced by he's 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 influenced much by Nietzsche and Seneca, which are two philosophers that I like as well. So I feel like nowadays, not like I have a much better understanding of kind of like where he's coming from. Although certainly he would he would not think that 
Um, and and I've talked to other people about his books and they essentially think I've completely have mis misinterpreted everything he's written. I don't think that's true. Um, anyway, I feel like I have a decent grasp of his thoughts. And I'm an expert on genetic modification of mosquitoes. So I have to react to this video. This is actually my first reaction video. So we'll see how this goes. Um, so I'm just gonna play the video pause it and, and give you my thoughts. This is, um, I, I do confess, I watched it once before because that's how I became aware of it. Um, all right, here we go. Three, two, one, go. Friends, hello. Friends, see, he is my friend. <laughs> oh, and by the way, uh, my name is Professor John Beckman, Dr. John Beckman, Senator John Beckman, the father of Sid, the transgenic mother of sin. Your hostess with the Moses, the ghetto green screen in the back. Here we go. Hello again. Uh, very quickly, I'm going to talk about, present the precautionary principle, why uh, you have to worry about genetic modification uh, and why th there's no connection between genetic modification and uh, natural selection or uh, mechanism of, of uh, breeding, uh, you know, uh, by tinkering that, that, that are very different. Okay, so let me try to translate this. First off, I think it's interesting. His books are very well written, very well understood, but I've watched a few of his videos. I don't think he's the best teacher. He seems, he seems always flustered and it's always hard to understand his arguments. I can kind of explain what he's saying though. Um, what he's saying is there's a difference between tinkering versus genetic modification, okay? Um, and he seems to have loves what he calls tinkering, which is essentially like allowing natural selection to process variants, mutations, and uh, variation, natural variation in nature on a slow timeline. Okay. And essentially, tinkering is essentially like you're making tiny little tweaks. And over the course of long periods of time, things that function better are selected for. Okay. That's, that's kind of like what he means by tinkering. And he's a big proponent of this in terms of engineering, like you might tinker with engineering, or it, I guess if you're going to um, make modifications of crops, he's not opposed to tinkering, which he would say, which what he said is breeding, right? Like, so if you're just doing natural breeding, the breeding process is slow, you're mixing traits and then you're progressively selecting over very slow periods of time for the best traits. He's not opposed to that. Um, later, you're gonna, he's going to talk about the GMOs. GMOs, which would be, that would be doing essentially the process of tinkering extremely fast. So you're literally just inserting something or you're literally just changing something quickly um, in an instant and then sort of like spreading that phenotype all over. Uh, that would be genetic modification. And really the big difference between these things is like the timelines, like the tinkering process allows things to happen very slowly, which is a safer process versus creating something genetic modification is very, very quick. And then introducing it into the, into essentially like a commercial industry and having it become super popular where like 95% of farmers are growing BT corn, uh, like you're changing the landscapes very, very, very quickly which is not something um, that creates robustness because robustness is built by things surviving over long periods of time to stress, surviving under stress, becoming anti-fragile over long periods of time. Genetic modification cannot, cannot necessarily produce that. That's, one, that's, that's, that's what he's hinting at here in the first 27 seconds. And nature much less risky. The Gates Foundation is financing a, a campaign to eradicate or tame or control the mosquito population using genetically modified mosquitoes. Okay, this is a this is a packed thing that he's saying, uh, and it's 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 far more nuanced than that. So what he's what he was saying was, Gates Foundation has a campaign um, to control mosquitoes with genetic modification. That's essentially like a summary of what he said. Let's unpack this. And the Gates Foundation is like, that. that's kind of, 
that's not that's not really exactly what's happening. Okay, so there's two different processes that I'm aware of that the Gates Foundation is funding. Riddle from Oxitech, the company Oxitech, which is now it's not it's no longer Oxitech. I can't remember the the company that bought it. It's a different company, or maybe it's still Oxitech, but its its ownership is different now. Um, and then there's the um, World Mosquito Program, which is running Wolbachia stuff. Okay, so in one of these, there's genetic modification. In another one, there's no, there's no genetic modification. So there's two different things that the Gates Foundation that I'm aware of that it's funding. This one is genetic modification of mosquitoes. So this one, I have videos on Riddle. I have videos on Oxitech Riddle. If you also, I have a video on these releases in Florida Keys. Um, if you go, if you go look, look at those, those are in the medical entomology playlist. Essentially, they have this is release of insects with the dominant lethal. Okay, so they have a DL, a dominant lethal killing gene, and it's under the control of a tet off promoter. So when there's tetracycline present, the gene is off. Okay, so they can rear these mosquitoes in the lab in the presence of tetracycline, the gene is off. Then what they do is they release, they, se they separate out males. Okay, they get males that have this dominant lethal transgene under the control of the TED off. They release these into the population, hundreds, thousands and thousands and thousands of male mosquitoes. These males mate with females, okay? The offspring all inherit the dominant lethal, okay? So this is a larval mosquito. The offspring all inherit this dominant lethal and these larvae are now growing up without tetracycline. So the gene turns on and it kills the larvae, okay? So what he's seen is a little bit of misleading. Um, it's not technically true. The Gates Foundation is not um, transforming populations with genetic modifications, or at least they're, they're not proposing that. Like in a sense, like if you grow, if you make BT corn and then you actually like grow it in the field, uh, you're, you're actually growing genetically modified corn in the wild. That's not really what's happening here. They're using a transgene to kill a population of mosquitoes. So the transgene should not be establishing in the wild population. Now, Nassim Taleb would come in here and say, well, how do you know all the effects of this and stuff like that, which is, which is like, okay, that's, that's legitimate. But essentially what I'm saying is they're not, they're not, they're not, they're not spreading transgenes into the population, or at least their intent is not to spread transgenes into the population. They're using transgenes to kill mosquitoes. Just a clarification there. Now, the other stuff that the Gates Foundation is doing is not genetic modification at all. It's totally different. Okay, so what they're doing is they have fruit flies, okay, and there are bacteria that live in the gonads of these fruit flies called Wolbachia. And Wolbachia, essentially what, what researchers have learned is if you take a needle and you take Wolbachia from one organism and you move it to a different organism, so in this case, Aedes aegypti mosquitoes, if you take the Wolbachia from Drosophila melanogaster, which is called WMEL, and you inject it into mosquitoes, which don't have it, Aedes aegypti mosquitoes do not have Wolbachia melanogaster. This process kind of like the, the mosquito isn't used to having these bacteria in there. And it sort of like stimulates the immune system. And these mosquitoes are less likely to transmit Zika and dengue. Okay, so this is what the World Mosquito Program is doing. They are not, not reducing populations of mosquitoes. They are, they are getting them infected with this sort of like probiotic bacteria, which stimulates their immune system. And there's no genetic modification here. There's no, there's no genetic mod modification. Now you can argue that these mosquitoes are different. Certainly they are because they're now infected with WML, which is different, but it's not a genetic modification. Now, the other difference here is in this case, on the riddle case, you can argue that these transgenes are not like naturally in these populations, okay? 
these transgenes are not naturally in mosquito populations. So this is introducing something like completely unnatural, but you can't say that for Wolbachia, okay? Wolbachia are present all throughout the world already in, in at least like 10 different orders of insects. And most mosquitoes actually already have Wolbachia. So Aedes albopictus already has two Wolbachia infections in it. Um, Culex pipiens is already infected with Wolbachia. Many, many mosquitoes and many flies different are already infected with Wolbachia. Now it's true that Aedes aegypti is not naturally infected with these Wolbachia. You're changing something here, but it's not like you're introducing something that has, is not already like present in the wild all over. Um, so like just the idea that, um, all this stuff is genetic modification. That's that's way too simple. That's too much of a simplification. That's not really. That's not really the case for either one. They're not spreading the genetic transgenes into the populations. Um, and in case number two, they're not even using transgenes at all. So let me give you a little bit of history. Of the last time we did something uh, that brilliant was under Mao. Around 1958, he initiated the four pest campaign, trying to tame at the time a bunch of uh, pests. Uh, and, and one of these pests was the sparrow, the sparrow, the bird. For the Communist Party and for Mao, it was a very dangerous bird. Uh, it represented archaic uh, China and capitalism and, and all these. Uh, uh, ideas that are obsolete. And they decided to kill all the sparrows by encouraging the population to make a lot of noise near their nests. So uh, the, the bird can't rest, uh, would drop dead of exhaustion. And they got rid of all the population. It's kind of surprising. That's a surprising way to kill birds. You just scream at them <laughs> and play heavy metal until they die. Uh, I didn't know you could kill birds that way. Population of uh, sparrows. Sparrows supposedly ate the crops of the farmers. So therefore, you had to, uh, you know, you, they, they, would they would have a scientifically approved society. And I he's always wearing these sweaters. He always wears these, like, that's like his thing. He's got these sweaters that he puts on his shoulders. Culture. Sure enough, what happened? Starvation. Why starvation? Because it all happened, and they didn't see, foresee it, that the sparrow also ate the insects. So. So I believe this, uh, this is probably, I mean, I don't know. I honestly don't know anything about this. I'm taking his word for it, but I believe it. And the reason I believe it is because um, fall armyworm, I know that a big controlling factor of fall armyworm is, is spare is like birds. They'll come in and they'll eat it. So it does, wouldn't surprise me at all. If you get rid of this, if you get rid of the local sparrows that all of a sudden you have a huge increase in agricultural pests. I think this is true with the fall armyworm. Now fact check me on that but I'm pretty sure it's true with fall armyworm. The sparrow. Actually, some farmers, actually, they will build um, sparrow houses in their fields and put them on trees by their fields to actually encourage the birds to come to help, help, control, the, help control the insect population. That is, that's true. Well, in a way, you know, they took their tax. They ate some of the crop, but they protected the crop. Well, that's nature. And, and sure enough, uh, China, you know, in a dire situation, had to import sparrows from, I think, the Soviet Union at the time, or Mongolia, or whatever. So, so his basic argument here that he's starting to pitch is that um, killing mosquitoes is like some kind of equivalence to killing the sparrows. And he's saying that because when they killed the sparrows, the sparrows were actually doing something like there was some positive factor that the humans were not aware of that they didn't perceive when they killed them. They didn't they didn't perceive these negative effects uh, of killing them. And so he's saying, like, if we kill mosquitoes, they might be doing something positive. In the in the population that we don't perceive, uh, I think you can always say that, like you can always say. You can always say like, oh, there might be like a mysterious positive thing that they're doing. And so therefore we can't get rid of them. But I think that the argument should be given a little bit more, a little bit more detail in a sense that 
first of all, like, like the levels of the, of what these things are in the food chain is totally different. Like sparrows are going to be like some kind of like a peak predator on the top. Mosquitoes essentially like literally all they're doing. And we're talking about a specific species of mosquito. This is, this is one thing that like people do not understand. We're not, we're not, they're not trying to kill all the mosquitoes in the entire planet. They're trying to kill a very, very specific or, or control a very specific species of mosquito, which is Aedes aegypti. Now, what you need to know about Aedes aegypti is it's mostly a, an urban, it's mostly an urban pest. It's literally, it's like a rat. It's, it's like associated with humans and evolved with humans. It feeds, it feeds specifically on humans and it lives in dumps. It lives in human like trash piles, in human like cities, in the pots and stuff. So like, if you're gonna make the argument that, well, maybe there's like fish that eat these larvae, these larvae are growing up in tires that don't have fish. This is literally like a rat that lives only in cities in high populations perpetuated by humans. Now there are sylvatic, like there are jungle living Aedes aegypti, that's true. Like it came from somewhere. Um, but the problem ones that we're talking about are evolved as pests of humans. So like, I don't, I, I don't think the argument that the mosquito has an equivalent um, role in the ecological like setting of a farmer's field I, I just don't see the equivalence there. It's like he's, again, it's like apples to, or maybe that's a dumb argument, but it's like comparing apples to oranges. Now, I do think like, again, like his argument that if you get rid of the mosquitoes, something bad could happen. Like you could say that about anything. Yes, like there's always something that you could not be seeing. And that definitely is like a big part of Nassim Taleb is like, what are the unforeseen consequences? Like that's what he focuses on. And so you have to understand that that's, 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 what, that's what his job is. He's a, he's, He's like a risk analyst analyst. He studies risk. And so he's an expert in kind of like thinking about like, what are the unforeseen consequences? So you have to understand that that's his viewpoint. And he has very, I think he has good thinking on that. But again, like his, I feel like one of the issues that I find with Nassim Taleb is he takes all his thinking, his philosophical thinking, and applies it to everything. And I just don't think it's applicable in all situations. Now he would say, I'm the idiot. Like, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not imagining that I live in a world where like unforeseen, unpredictable things can happen. I, and I think that's a fair argument. I think you could say that, but again, like, I just don't see them as equivalent. I see this as a very bad example because this species is so such a pest, such a specific thing. Um, Think it's not like it's having broad eco. I don't. I don't buy the argument that it's having broad ecological impact. It's literally just a thing that grows up in trash piles in the city, living next to humans. Whatever there, there were some sparrows left. I mean, so, I should also say that in the Caribbean islands, in there are there are certain Caribbean island islands in which they have successfully eradicated Aegis aegypti, and nothing bad happened. So again, the equivalent of like, well, when Mao killed the sparrows, when communist Mao China killed the sparrows, there were bad things that happened. Um, like there are other islands that have actually got rid of Aedes aegypti and, no and nothing bad happened. So like, I, I just don't think that that argument holds so much strength. This is a nice lesson. Quickly, let me explain why genetic modification. So we had two problems. The first one is messing with nature by eliminating species, not knowing the side effects. Yeah, see, that's what, that's what he's now worried about. A lot. Again, I think it's fair, but he applies all his thinking to, to, to everything, which is, I don't know, like, I just don't know if it's valid in every single scenario. With the reintroduction of wolves that <laughs> you can have side effects like the, the entire ecosystem. Again, he's talking about effects of predators. Like wolves are peak predators. It, it strikes me that sparrows would also be peak predators. Like I'm, I'm sure there's a, there's probably like a hawk that eats sparrows, but they're probably near the top. It's probably hard to get a sparrow as fruit. They're probably near the top of the food chain. So it's, again, it's going to be like a different effect. Changes 
by the reintroduction of a single predator that was there. Yeah, for mosquitoes a long time. are not predators. Even rivers started changing They're course. Small little rivers blood. started changing course in France after the introduction. So you have side effects. They didn't see that, and we don't know the side effects ahead of time. Uh, that's something. That's not again. Like that's that's what he worries about. We don't know the side effects ahead of time, which is why again I don't think he's opposed to everything. He's opposed to doing things too quickly, which I do agree with. You don't want to do things too quickly because if you do things slowly, it allows you to see the bad things that that arise and then you can fix them in time. Thing that I'll present in a more complicated lecture on uh, <laughs> computational irreducibility. But now quickly, let me explain the uh, the why why we have to worry about. <clears throat> processes that are too fast for nature. This is X, say. So again, he said like it, when you do things too quickly, it can create scenarios where nature can't respond. And so you get these scenarios where things then crash and fall apart. That's what he doesn't want. He doesn't want that to happen. And he worries that genetic engineering, again, just too fast. The intensity or anything, X is, random, is a variable, okay? And F of X is a harm can be any uh, uh, representation of harm, but say the, the harm, okay? And let's uh, apply that to speed, okay? So this is the speed and, and the harm you can get from accidents from speed. It's pretty much gonna be like that. And f of x, say, if you walk slowly, it's so let me bring up a point here that's worth worth, worth talking about. Again, because he's talking about, okay, well, these processes that we're talking about, both of these are just too fast. The nice thing about these two processes, which he's not pointing out, is both these processes are very local. They're very localized. So it's not as if like if it's not as if like when 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 Oxytech releases these insects in the Florida Keys, it's not as if there's going to be effects in Texas. It's not as if there's going to be effects even in northern Florida. This is very, very localized, okay? And mosquitoes themselves, they don't travel very far. Like I think, okay, check me, fact check me on this, but in the early Wolbachia studies, I think when they're doing the releases, the mosquitoes wouldn't even fly across the road. Like they would not even cross the road. And so this was actually, it was actually difficult to get them to establish over big geographical, um, big geographical areas. And that was actually like, that's actually like in hindsight, I think that's actually a really good thing about these technologies. It's not like, it's not like um, it's going to all of a sudden explode. So I think, I think he's, he's arguing that these things are too fast. My argument is actually of all the things that people are proposing, these things are actually some of the slowest, some of the most localized things, which is why I like them, which is why I support them. Because again, like if you're talking about other things, if you're talking about like blanket use of insecticides in the entire state of Florida, the effects of that are going to be far worse than releasing like a few genetically modified mosquitoes in, in southern Florida Key Islands, or in, for instance, releasing some Wolbachia in some cities in Australia. Now, certainly those releases have expanded, but they've expanded because they did it slowly and it was successful. That's why they've expanded, not because it like broke out of containment and it was too fast practically impossible to get harmed uh, hitting someone else. So this is why we don't have pedestrians dying. Okay, so he's he's literally just bringing up, we learned in physics, uh, what's the kinetic energy formula? Um, one half MV squared is equal to kinetic energy. Essentially, the importance of this is that velocity is, the kinetic energy you have is velocity squared. So the faster you move, the more likely you are to get fucked up if you move. That's actually like a physical formula. It's true. The faster you do shit, the more likely you are to cause fucked up shit to happen. I mean, that's legit. Like, I don't, I'm not arguing with that. I'm arguing that the stuff that he's talking about is actually much slower compared to other things that would be done. From collision, uh, look at New York City, say at uh, 5 p.m., walk around and <laughs> you see how the mechanism works. And you don't have accidents and ambulances coming to rescue uh people who uh, uh his videos are so blurry he needs to get a better iphone
uh, are bleeding to death because they, they hit another pedestrian. No, pedestrian to pedestrian. So the speed, as you got. So here you say if I go 10 times the speed, I have 100 times the risk. And then, of course, it goes like that. And then if I have 10 times the speed, if I have 20 times the speed, I have maybe 500 times the risk. So until, of course, it's exponential. where your harm has probably The faster won, you go, the harm and, and raises say, exponentially. If you drive at 800 miles per hour, your risk of getting to destination is practically zero. So this shows a nonlinearity of risk. So, uh, you know, natural selection produces animal, but doesn't spread to something wild because they are controls, because the step is progressive and, and slow. You can skip steps with, uh, you know, breeding, domestication of animals, breeding you can skip steps, but you're still not harming nature too much because yeah, uh, the, the speed is again. So, so just, I guess the final comment is if he's, if he's drawn this risk curve, risk and pain curve, and what he's saying is that ge genetic modification of organisms is out here where the, where the harm is exponential. But breeding is down here where it's safe. And we know it's safe because people have been breeding for 10,000 years. Although you could argue with that. I mean, you could even say the agricultural revolution that happened 10,000 years ago was the worst thing to happen to humans. And people have argued that. Or the worst thing to happen to the ecologic, ecology of the planet. People have certainly argued that. What I'm saying is that this, isn't, this characterization of GMOs in general might be true, but riddle and the World Mosquito Program and Wolbachia in general are much closer to down here. They're not, they're not, they're not something that, that what he's, he's not understanding it. Um, and again, like the riddle is very localized suppression. It doesn't explode. It's, it's, it's not there, it's too slow. So I've introduced, we're gonna have a more complete session on uh, fragility, nonlinearity, convexity, gensity. I will watch that video when you post it. Inequality, all these concepts associated with uh, fragility later. And then, of course, we'll have another one on the precautionary principle. But I just had to barge in because I'm intellectually and personally offended by everything Bill Gates represents. Oh my God, that's like, that's, that's pretty hard. <laughs> Man, he's serious. Especially with with this uh, arrogance of thinking that he could do what Mao Zedong failed to do. Thank you very much, and have a good day. Wow! Again, yeah, like that. And man, he yeah, he's he's upset. Um, in interesting philosophical discussion there at the end. Like, is is. Is it is it arrogance? This, it, I mean, on some level, I suppose supposing you can think uh, you can help is a little bit of arrogance. Um, like, again, let me just finish with like one thing I do like that Nassim Taleb sort of like hints at is you never want to get rid of all the stresses. And so like you you might imagine a scenario where every everybody like wants to get rid of dengue everybody wants to get rid of malaria everybody wants to get rid of all these bad horrible diseases that's true like it makes sense like what you would want to get rid of these you don't want your kids dying in these diseases but on some level you don't want to live in a disease free world because then you have no stress and your immune system totally collapses and then you expose yourself to an extinction event when a virus actually comes down the line later like you don't want to get rid of all sickness you need some stress on the system. And that's one thing that Nassim Taleb talks about that like, I think is really valuable. But these diseases are nasty. Like dengue kills people, malaria kills people. Uh, and you're literally arguing, I mean, at that point, you're literally arguing like you want, it's better to let natural selection take its course and let people die of these diseases than it is to fix them. I don't, I'm not prepared to say that. Like, I mean, I'm hardcore, but I don't know if I'm that hardcore. I don't know. That's that's pretty harsh, in my opinion. I don't know. What do you guys think? Write it in the chat. Uh, post your comments. Hit like, hit share, hit subscribe, follow the channel. This is my first reaction video. If you liked it, if you thought it was good, again, hit like, hit share. I make all these videos 
And um, if anybody finds them valuable, like it really does motivate me when you hit like, even if I just get one like on a video, it's like, holy shit, I got to let me feel good. I, I got to do another one. I got to do another one. So yeah, like it, you, you wouldn't think it matters, but it does. Like I started liking a bunch of people's YouTube videos. Every time I see a video that I like, I hit like, uh, it's really important because like as a content producer, like you need that, you need that little dopamine fix. Otherwise, it, 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 like that's the one thing that makes it worthwhile at the end of the day. It's so strange, but little things help. So uh, love y'all. Have a good Friday. Um, friends, 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 Roman countrymen, lend me your ears. See you later. Bye-bye.